With your help, we can continue to fight for freedom, reach new audiences, and bring important information to the public free of charge. This is not possible without your generosity. Join our quest for the truth and our freedom and donate today. Simply go to TNTradio.live. Perception versus the truth. This is Connecting the Dots with Matt Aaron on today's News Talk TNT Radio. All right, welcome back to Connecting the Dots for the first segment of the second hour, where I'm very, I'm very, very happy to be joined by a guest who's been on my radar for a long time. I've been a, an admirer of his research. His historical deep dives have been something I found of high, high value. And this is my first time actually interfacing in live time with Richard Poe, New York Times bestselling author, somebody who's written a lot, a lot of material to help people de- or help demystify certain concepts that have been brought to people's attention in greater um, focus in the last three, four years for obvious reasons. Um, but there's a lack of clarity, a lack of context. So I love what uh, Richard has done in being able to to provide a little bit of meat and bones, a lot of meat and bo- meat to the bones of concepts like the deep state. What is this? What is this thing? What is shadow government? What is this? It's a very, it's almost useless to say deep state or shadow government. It's it, if you don't define it within a historical context, guided by personalities, intentions, and goals. And so, Richard, thank you for coming on. The first question before we go into some history um, is your book, your newest book is Hillary's Secret Wars, right? Or Hillary's Secret War is the name of your new book. Um, no, actually, that's an older one. Uh my most recent political book was actually uh, The Shadow Party, which I co-wrote with David Horowitz. And that right, was- how um, George Soros and Hillary uh, took over the, the Democratic Party? Yeah, that was, th- that was actually a book that uh, it turned out to be one of the first uh, books that, that alerted people to uh, Soros' involvement with color revolutions. And it was used as the basis for Glenn Beck's uh, three-part series, the the Puppet Master, in uh, uh, 2010, which uh, apparently uh, played a role in getting Glenn kicked off of Fox News, and so he mm-hmm. based that uh, he based that series on uh, our book, The Shadow Party, and it exposed to a national TV audiences uh, audience uh, Soros's now very well-known role in uh, funding and helping to uh, orchestrate color revolutions. But back then, it was a totally forbidden subject. And um, it uh, apparently got, I think Glenn now denies that it got him kicked off of Fox News. That's fine. I I know he's got non-disclosures and things like that. But uh, I was there through the process. I'm pretty sure it was quite essential to why he got kicked off. But anyway, not not to dispute that. Um, so I had been actually going after Soros for a long time. I, I I wrote positively about Soros in my very first book, How to Profit from the Coming Russian Boom, back in 1993, uh, when I was still very much with the program, you know, with the whole Cold War um, neoliberal agenda and all that. And I wrote positively about Mr. Soros. Uh, he he declined my request for an interview, but kindly allowed me to interview some of his people there in Russia. But then um, much later in uh, 2004, uh, I got a call from Chris Ruddy at Newsmax, and I was then one of the early columnists at Newsmax. And Chris asked me if I'd like to do a cover story for their magazine, Newsmax magazine, exposing Soros. So long story short, I did the, a, a cover story on Soros, which uh, was immediately uh, immediately made me uh, an even bigger target of uh, media matters for America than I had already been because of Hillary's secret war. And um, oh, we were off to the races. So uh, I sort of made, you know, I, I, I sort of got branded as the anti-Soros guy for a while. And um, 
that cause you know, many of the usual sorts of you know uh, problems and kickback that you get when you go after Soros. And uh, I actually stayed away from political writing for quite some time. So um, I'm now getting back into it. Uh, in, in was really only in uh, 2020 I sort of emerged from my. Uh, I'm going to call it self-imposed exile. I learned that word when when Mel Gibson made his big comeback with um, Hacksaw Ridge. Remember that? And I, all the all the entertainment uh, writers were saying they were using the same phrase, saying Mel Gibson has, has come back from his self-imposed exile. <laughs> his his ten-year self-imposed exile. And I was thinking, really, it was self-imposed? I, I don't know. <laughs> but um, <laughs> right anyway well, let me ask I, you this please... so what what was yeah. it that that made you come back uh in 2020 well um it was i it was it was actually in in the heart of it, the covid lockdown had just begun and as strange as this may sound um Bob Dylan's song came out about JFK. Um, you know that what was that song called? Um I forget the name, but I know what you mean. Yeah, and it was a big hit, and I just was listening and listening to it over and over again, sitting at my laptop as I'm sitting right now. And I just said, you know, he's telling us that we have to be courageous you know he's telling us we 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 all sat and did nothing and let jfk get assassinated and now we have to do something i just i just felt it as if it were a personal message from from bob dylan uh, who of whom i'm a big fan from way back of course and um uh, it was also one of the best songs he's done for a very long time since since his you know classic era but I, I was very much taken by it, and I just felt, okay, I'm going to take this as a sign that it's time for me to get off my butt and do something. And so as soon as I said to myself, I'm not going to be cautious anymore, I'm just going to say what I want, it became very clear exactly what I needed to do. And there was a whole series of things. Um things that I needed to publish, which I'd written before, new things that I needed to write about. But the biggest thing that became clear, and then, and then I st went, on, uh, went on Twitter in April, and the biggest thing that it was very clear that I needed to start writing about was the British, um, because that was the, the British role in the origins of um, Glo what we now call globalism, uh, we used to call it British imperialism, but their their um, absolutely central role in creating the modern form of this thing we call globalism um, is is simply not well understood. And the thing is, I had been aware of it for maybe thirty years um, in various aspects of it, but absolutely as a professional journalist and as a uh, a person involved with with uh, sort of neocon think tanks you know being in that world no way was i ever going to talk about that subject uh, that subject you know well i i'm not even going to go into it but it it you know when you're in that world it, the subject really t hits close to home let, let's say uh, mm -hmm. You can't talk about that without stepping on a lot of people's feet. It's there. It's all around you. And um, anyway, so for whatever reason, that was it. That topic was forbidden. And it was so forbidden, nobody even knew the topic existed. And um, well, people knew it existed. But so so the thing is, one of the funny things that, that happened is when the shadow party came out and that came out in 2006 and all kinds of weird and spooky stuff happened uh, our book was leaked to media matters for america uh, i think two weeks before publication and it was leaked by our own publicist that is by the publicist hired 
by our um, our publisher, and he's sort of claimed that uh, oh well, there's no such thing as bad publicity, but he leaked our book to the enemy, to Media Matters of all people, who did this hit piece on it. Uh, I think it may have been eight days before publication. And in the headline of this hit piece, which is, I think, 6,000 words long, and basically saying our book was all lies, 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 and uh, we got all our facts wrong, this, that, and the other. But in the headline, they accuse us of being uh, acolytes of Lyndon LaRouche. They, you know, they, they, they said uh, this is a LaRoucheian take on George Soros, something like that. And um, that, sir, in, in the case of my co-author and then employer, David Horowitz, I'm quite sure that's not true. In my case, I may be <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, LaRouche was not soft on David Horowitz at all. <laughs> I remember. Uh, I remember reading some stuff in 2007. That was yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> that's funny that they, that, that's how they chose to get you guys. <laughs> so, and we didn't even say anything about the British. It was just the fact that we were going after Soros and his color revolutions and and all that. They associated that with uh, LaRouche. Um, to what extent accurately, I'm not sure. I mean, the the EIR had done a lot of stuff on Soros, but I was I probably relied a lot more on um, Connie Bruck's article in the New Yorker. She she I don't know if you remember that piece. She came out with a big, really long article in January of 1995. And it was, uh, she interviewed Soros, she interviewed all these really top people who dealt with him. And that's really the definitive article on him. And that, mm -hmm. that's the one that I relied on most. And and uh, the, the funny thing is, Connie Brooks should have gotten an instant book deal from that. Uh, no one has done a more in-depth, better article on Soros than Connie Brooks in 1995. And she did not get a book deal, crazily insanely and then they took her off the sorrel speed and put this other person who shall who shall go unnamed on the sorrel speed who was just not of the same caliber well anyway so they 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 called it they called us larusha i think this article this hit piece is still is still up there so that just shows you you know no matter what you did if you if you barely moved a muscle you might be accused of, of being some kind of unacceptable person. Now, in my case, I I did have a lot of knowledge of of the Russian uh, worldview. I had subscribed to EIR since the early '90s, and um, I was very much influenced by it. Um, in fact, I would say, uh. Well, I, I'm going to go for broke here, you know, in the spirit of Bob Dylan's song, whose name I can't remember. But I mean, I, I used to subscribe to this weekly publication called The, the Spotlight, uh, published by Willis Cardo. I'm, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's, let's say it's quite far to the right. And it's, you, you know, um, correctly deemed to be in the, um, well, I... I you know, it, it was into Holocaust revisionism and stuff like that. That's not why I read it, and I don't believe any of that kind of stuff. But um, I started reading it because they they were focused more than any other publication on the, uh, these big globalist groups like the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergers, and all that. But yes, they did have this anti-Semitic slant to them, um, which I did not share, and I still don't to this day. Um, and what I discovered, and, and through them, I, I think it was through the spotlight, I discovered uh, Eustace Mullins, and he too um, wrote very interestingly about globalism and its origins, but he too had a very uh, anti-Jewish slant where, in which he basically uh, pointed to the Rothschilds, and especially the London Rothschilds as being the, the head of the snake. And so, uh, again, you know, I, I was reading anything I could. I, I, I subscribed to all kinds of newsletters in those days. This, these were the days 
when you had to order newsletters through the mail if you wanted to get exotic material. And uh, I subscribe to everything from the far left to the far right. I just wanted to know the truth. Yeah, you're trying to make sense of things, right? You're like, give me something that will, will help paint a picture of reality. <laughs> <laughs> it, right. it's, all, it's all information everywhere you look so how do you triangulate on on the truth you gotta go into some dumpsters sometimes and look right for, Ex exactly really. and, and, and and um so the thing is what i what i quickly learned is that there is there is is um there was basically a, a kind of anti-semitic narrative underlying most of the anti-globalist literature that you that you saw out there, yes, there was a little bit on the left in those days, like Holly Sklar's Trilateralism. That was a book I read early, and Bertram Gross's um, uh, Friendly Fascism. So I was reading books like that. In those days, if you can imagine, the left was anti-globalist, um, and or at least there was an element that was focused on the the problem of globalism, loss of sovereignty. They quickly changed that. But so I first approached it through the left, but then I quickly saw that this area of discourse was dominated by um, what we can we can call it the far right and pretend that's what it is. Um, but it's really more of the national socialist right. And yeah, that's the thing. I, I find myself too sometimes because I, I also look at a lot of this history and you're like, just by matter of the discourse, I'm like, yeah, these right wing governments of South America or whatever. And wait, I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> that that's not really that's not doing justice to the idea. There's the specific type of more than left and right because it's kind of convergent. Hitler was also an eco, you know, conservationist as well. But it, it's 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 fascism. It, it's it's a it's a different thing. It's not conservative versus liberal. It's it's a, an idea of feudalism masquerading as something uh, modern and acceptable. But here, let's let's pull on this thread when we come back from a short commercial break on uh, today's news talk TNT. Okay. TNT's Alex Zaharoff Roy. Google's Gemini AI has image generation capabilities, but people have been noticing something remarkable. The images keep on wanting to show what's known as diverse results. So, if you ask to see an image of America's founding fathers, uh, who were predominantly a group of white men, people of African American descent are being shown. I mean, there were uh, black founders, but they, they're not the sort of the standard thing that you think of when you see uh, that in your mind. People also ask for a picture of the Pope and the black man is shown. Another prompt asked for images of German Nazi soldiers from 1943. And while one white man is shown, the next image is of a woman of Asian appearance. And then a man of black appearance is also shown, which simply isn't what you expect to see at all. There's been obviously a huge uproar about this uh, with people naturally accusing Google of being woke and inserting diversity uh, equity and inclusion everywhere. Talking tech with Alex Zaharoff White on today's News Talk TNT. TNT is an independent global news talk station that does what others only say they do. TNT is a live radio and TV broadcaster that simply tells the truth 24 hours a day, seven days a week. No one in the world does what we do. Crisscrossing the globe, providing credible news and opinion all day and all night. In two and a half years, TNT has become a credible and exciting platform with brilliant hosts and staff. It's a critical time, and we must continue to call out the misinformation and propaganda from mainstream media and their powerful sponsors. We're now appealing to our many friends and supporters around the world to go to TNTradio.live and make a small donation to TNT while we seek the right investors to continue our important mission if you're talking about it we're talking about it today's news talk radio tnt all right we're back with connecting the dots second segment second hour with richard poe um we're pull there's a lot of different doors that we that that have come up in this convers this brief conversation so far that I'd, I'd love to open and walk through and it's difficult to sort of decide which one and i'm sure that they're all going to kind of converge on, on um similar eurekas anyway for a lot of people listening but you brought up so far 
the British hand behind globalism. That's something mm -hmm. that is sort of an unspoken thing. There's like this invisible cage in uh, polite society that the think tank world that you were navigating through that you just couldn't press up against or go beyond these little fences of the mind. Um, you, you've since obviously shaken off some of that, <laughs> some of that fear Indeed. and really <laughs> embraced a courageous uh, attitude to go there. Um, but you've also brought up uh, Soros and the question of a lot of the anti-Semitic literature that does say a lot of factual truths that are often also ignored in official narratives, but tend to have this um, this spin coloring the explanation mm -hmm. of the Federal Reserve, the, the different conspiracies and revolutions as being all Jewish conspiracy stuff. We see it today all over the place. And frankly, Benjamin Netanyahu is not helping. He's not helping mm -hmm. the cause of those who want to try to help out, <laughs> uh, put some some water on the flames of anti-Semitism, which is obviously increasing nowadays. Um, almost like every time that there's a, a crisis where people's lives are threatened, uh, the Jews are, are always kind of there as a kind of convenient scapegoat to be thrown at the angry mobs and hordes of pitchfork wielding, you know, angry citizens. There's always some Jews to be thrown at them uh, by the oligarchs. So how did you how did you approach this? Like a lot of people would say that Soros, it's a Soros conspiracy. It's a Rothschild Jewish conspiracy that's behind all of our problems. Um, how do you, how do you formulate it? How did you see where the the truth or the falsehood existed in these types of narratives? Well, this is this is exactly the point I was getting to before the the commercial break, is that um, mm. I you know I was I was reading all, all this stuff you know this Willis Carter's spotlight Eustace Mullins, um, learning a lot about the origins of globalism, but troubled by the anti-Semitic uh, slant on it. And that's uh, so, somewhere in, during that time is when I discovered uh, EIR and the LaRouchians. And um, this might sound a little strange to people who aren't really familiar with the material, but the very thing that struck me about it and that frankly uh, drew me to it was the fact that they were offering what seemed to be a very plausible history and explanation of globalism that was expressly not anti-Semitic. Uh, it, it, was, it was so refreshing and so unusual considering everything else that's out there practically. And so um, that was expressly the thing that I found when, and I first read Dope Inc. And then I read another book about George Bush. It was called The Real George Bush or something like that. Uh, I can't remember. Yeah, unauthorized biography. Right. And now those two books, especially Dope Inc. Dope Inc., I would recommend to anyone uh, to this day. It, it, and it gives a very, it, although its subject is um, the the global, yes, yes, there it is. Uh, its subject is the, the uh, global drug trade and how the British crown has um, allegedly continued to run it back from the, since the days of the 19th century when everybody knew they were running it. And then supposedly they stopped, but according to this book, they didn't. Well, anyway, it, so it focuses on that issue, but it in the process of it, it kind of explains the whole background of what I call the hidden power of Great Britain in the world and the British origins of globalism and, and how it really works. And even to some extent, how George Soros fit into it. Uh, Soros is uh, it mentioned a bit in that book. And so I became interested in, in the LaRouche material, I would say really for that reason, because it was so refreshing to see somebody de dealing with these issues of globalism without saying that the Jews were behind the whole thing. And that's so ironic because what were the Laurusians being attacked about, especially in, at that time, they were they were being attacked by the ADL as being anti-Semitic and fascist and and all this. And that was the very thing, the very thing I found intriguing about them is that they weren't. You know, they, they weren't. I mean everybody else was, but but they weren't. So um so it became kind of a, a secret vice. I mean, I was in the mainstream world. I was a mainstream best-selling author. I was a mainstream journalist. 
Um, I, I was, as I mentioned, I wrote for Newsmax. I became a contributing editor there. Uh, I went to work for um, David Horowitz in his think tank. And I just, you know, I walked the line, uh, which all journalists must walk. You know, I, I tried to be a good boy and say the things that you can say and not say the things you're not supposed to say. Sometimes it gets a little confusing, but the, all the while I was, you know, continuing to to um, enrich, <laughs> let's say enrich my mind with alternative news sources, in, including the LaRouchian ones. And uh, it, just over a period of many years, I, it just it just became clearer and clearer that this. I, I would say the LaRouchian worldview to, to this day, after so many years of reading, it still the, strikes me as the closest to the truth, because now we see on on X, uh, once again, there's this emergence of anti-Jewish um, sentiment which seems to be uh, encouraged somehow um, by the lords of, of um, you know, cyber censorship. And everybody's saying the Rothschilds this, the Rothschilds that. The only thing that matters is the Rothschilds. I have been called an agent of the Rothschilds by people who dis who didn't like the fact that I'm saying, are you really sure the Rothschilds rule the world? Are you really sure they're behind everything? I mean, Maybe there's somebody else involved with great affairs other than them. Just saying that will get you called a, a creature of the Rothschilds in today's yeah. uh, environment. And so, and and it's only just begun. It's going to get really crazy. I, I'm telling you, Matt, it's going to get nuts because everyone is going to have to get on board with this anti-Jewish thing. I see it coming. And if you're not with, if you're not with that then you're against it. And so um, I continued to see the LaRouchian worldview as I did all those years ago, I guess it's all, well, 30 years ago or more, as a voice of reason uh, amidst a cacophony of madness, <laughs> if, mm. if I may say that. Um, and I'm not a LaRouchian, as, as you know. I mean, I... I disagree with a lot of things uh, in some ways i'm unconvinced maybe maybe i'll be persuaded i i i, I used to be a pretty straight up libertarian uh, since the time i was 19 years old i read murray rothbard's for a new liberty and i decided i was a libertarian for various reasons um and one of the things where EIR and the LaRouchian opus, if you will, has, I think, really persuaded me is on this issue of the American system and the, and the need for tariffs, uh, a trajectory that our founding fathers went through, because many of them were actually free traders, and they learned through very harsh experience that uh, we needed tariffs. And, and uh, I learned through my more recent research that the the actual reason for uh, for establishing for writing the American Constitution was specifically to give a a power of of imposing of regulating trade of imposing tariffs on a national scale to the federal government. I I didn't know that until recently, but that was the actual reason they felt it was necessary because the Articles of Confederation which the libertarians think are, you know, the be all and end all, and we should have stuck with them. They literally did not allow the federal government to impose national tariffs. And so when the British, uh, immediately after the signing of the peace treaty in 1783, the British immediately launched a trade war uh, against us, as you know, mm -hmm. doing their usual uh, tactic of, of dumping uh, artificially low-priced goods, uh, the low prices um, made possible, of course, by, by state subsidies, crown subsidies, uh, by this dumping destroyed the entire U.S. economy, caused secession movements, armed rebellion in Massachusetts, the Shays Rebellion, and all kinds of other skullduggery that were being whipped up uh, by the British to destroy 
the United States j just out of the starting gate. It was because of this ter terrible crisis I recently learned that the founding fathers got together and said, we need to be able to regulate our trade at a national level. And that was the very reason I have read now that the Constitution was created. It was it was more that reason than any other. Right? And um, George Washington, when he uh, in a, when he became president uh, under the Constitution, there was no president under the uh, Articles of Confederation. When Washington was inaugurated, he wore a, a homespun suit that was actually made, I think, in Hartford, Connecticut. And I read the story of this. It, it, it was apparently very a little difficult for them to find um, a, a tailor, a, a, a manufacturer of, of, of textiles that was actually capable of producing a high quality suit. You could only get that from England or elsewhere in mm. Europe, but, but specifically from England is where we used to get them. And there's a whole story of how they did a whole search and they found this one place in Hartford, Connecticut that could actually make a men's suit that was suitable for the president. It reminds me of a little bit. It, it's an, an irony, but it reminds me a little bit of that 1984. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. A uh, speech by Thomas Sankara, the president of Burkina Faso, at the um, the league. The, there's a, a league neutrality uh, meeting amongst a lot of the colonialized peoples, and he gives this beautiful speech right before he's murdered. But he comes mm. out saying, "Look, we need economic sovereignty. Like this is how America was built." I'm wearing a, a suit right now. It's made in Burkina Faso by Burkina Fasoans. We all need to stand together because if you don't stand with me, I'm not going to be here next year to give a speech. <laughs> and it's mm. painful. Like I laugh uncomfortably here, but it's it's like the irony of this being the heritage of the United States as far as becoming a sovereign real country that then found itself behind a murder of somebody who was just trying to model his experience to save his country on the what the United States did as well, that that the U.S. has fallen so out of whack with its own heritage that it would permit that that to happen. Uh, I didn't know about the story of, of Washington, but that's what that's what it reminded me of. Well, yes, and and um, you know this issue of um, regulating one's own trade, and specifically um, in with respect to the British textile industry, which had a global monopoly uh, for a very long time. This does emerge persistently in, in a lot of these um, narratives of, of third world liberation that um, swept the world in the 1950s and 60s. You, you know, this and, and of course, Gandhi, that, that was a big issue for him. And it was an issue for those countries, those newly liberated countries in the post-war era, it was an issue for them for the same reason it was an issue for us because we were still we were all dealing with the same uh master the same entity which was great britain and its global monopoly on textile manufacturers and its its insistence on maintaining that monopoly at at any cost and um yes as you say matt it, it is it is ironic and tragic that America should now find itself in, in many ways as being, um, well, the way I see it, I, I, I don't know if you would agree with this, but I, I, I see, um, I don't see America as having replaced Great Britain. I, I take a, a view that we are still very much um, controlled by them. Uh, that, that's the, how it seems to me. And it doesn't take us off the hook. It, mean, it doesn't mean we're innocent of all the things that we do, uh, you know, but I, I still believe that the, uh, let's call it the neo-colonial neo control that Great Britain exercises over the U.S. is very decisive uh, and much more than, than most of us realize. And I I, I actually don't know what what your position on that is, you know, to 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 what extent that that um, is your position or ever was, but um, no. just to I, taking I the agree. okay, great. Um, so so for an example of that, a recent example of that, this very striking was Eric Prince, um, just a, a few days ago, 
suddenly announced um, and is that uh, he says the America should should colonize Africa, the entire continent of Africa, and all of Latin <laughs> Latin America. He says so that we can prevent. He says, look, we have we have runaway uh, immigration at the border, so we have to colonize all of Latin America to stop these immigrants from coming in. And I'm like, how, how about closing the border? You know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> So he, he he he's 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 done this video and everybody's sharing it. He says we have to recolonize. Well, he says we have to colonize Africa and colonize all of Latin America. It's time. Let's do it. Um, maybe a little self-serving, coming from the the leading vendor of mercenary services to to the United States. Um, I imagine that would be uh, th there's a lot of, th that would be a big you know, a big hit on the sales in the sales department. But um, the, what's interesting about that is everyone was saying, oh, my gosh, those evil Americans, they're so they're, they're so aggressive. They're so ambitious. They're so imperialist. And so I put up Eric Prince's video and then I put under I put underneath it something I've been harping on forever, which is I, I said, Yes, uh, Eric Prince says we should conquer two continents um, for some reason, but this was not his idea. This idea was put forth by the British in, uh, I think it was January of 2005. They called it the New Imperialism, and it was this guy, Andrew Roberts. I, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's, he's, yeah, he writes for the know, Daily Mail. Yeah, yeah and, and he's he's right. He, he's a historian. He writes all these books, and he's kind of... Um, He's kind of the the, the court historian of, of of the British imperial establishment uh, right now, right up there with Neil Ferguson. Although he has a di a, a slightly different mission or style, mm -hmm. uh, I guess Andrew Roberts is supposed to be the old style imperialist, and Neil Ferguson um, is the Our new liberal, style. Uh, but it's sort of yeah. a good cop, bad cop kind of thing. But they're both pushing yeah. the same agenda, anyway. So this Andrew Roberts, um, I only mentioned that because he has a, some sort of obvious official status, and he as much as said so in this article. So he wrote this article in, um, I think it was the Daily Mail in 2005, and the literal headline of this article was Colonize Africa. It was a, a two-word, or he said Recolonize Africa, I think. It was a two-word headline. And what he said... He said, what I'm going to tell you is not just coming from me. I have spoken to people at the highest level of the British establishment. And I can tell you that pretty much everybody is on board with this agenda, even those who will not come forward and say so, he announced. Uh, and I believe him. So then he, he went on to say, look, Africa is a mess. You know, all this corruption, all this dictatorship, they're slaughtering each other. We need to go back in there and reconquer it and uh, recolonize it uh, for the good of the Africans themselves. And he said, um, this will be a joint project of all the English speaking countries. They're all going to be in on it together, helping us uh, to do God's work and, um, and on and on like that. And then he expressly said, <laughs> amusing, amusingly, but weirdly, he said, he said, <laughs> he said the French, and the Germans will not be allowed. <laughs> will not be allowed to participate. Oh my God! <laughs> because of because of their horrible behavior during the colonial era and the great cruelty with which they treated the Africans. So he was he was harking back to the the old British propaganda they, about what the Germans really... did with. The... <laughs> They really drink their own Kool-Aid, eh? It's something else. Yeah, and you can just feel the ghost of Cecil Rhodes just imbued, just sputtering out of, of, of Andrew's voice. And then you hear the, the same voice just sort of using Eric Prince's almost like an automata. Uh, just right. Spewing, they're obviously not even really his own. So on that note, let's go for a quick commercial break, and we're going to keep on uh, pushing in this direction on how the British are at the heart of so many of America's problems, and most Americans have no clue uh, right when we come back from break on today's News Talk TNT. 
With his expert analysis and opinion, this is TNT Radio's Timothy Shea. Americans love an underdog and nothing makes us happier than a comeback. Perhaps the most moronic thing written in the 20th century was F. Scott Fitzgerald's line that there are no second acts in American lives. Perhaps what he meant to write was there aren't only second acts in American lives because many, myself included, have proven that there are not only second acts but third, fourth, and even fifth acts. We're witnessing a political comeback now, the likes of which we've not seen since Richard M. Nixon in 1968. Donald Trump is on a roll to become president of the United States once again, and perhaps taking as many as 40 states along the way. The UAW in Michigan has supported him, the first Republican they've supported since Ronald Reagan, because they understand that Democrat policies with regards to electric vehicles aren't in their interest. Black people are flocking to Trump, Hispanic people, union guys and gals, basically Americans. Sarah Huckabee Sanders had it partially correct when she said this election is between normal and crazy, but really this election is between Americans and America haters. From MAGAinstitute.com, this is Timothy Shea for today's News Talk TNT. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. You're listening to Connecting the Dots with Matt Arendt on today's News Talk Radio. TNT. TNT. All right, we're back for the third segment of the second hour with Richard Poe. Going through, uh, we were just discussing before the break, the idea of the undead British Empire as as an active force that didn't disappear, as we've been told, you know, big narrative, everybody believes, everybody knows, everybody intelligent knows that after World War II, the British gave up their colonies, they became... An, 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 a non-empire, a post-empire, and they gave the baton over to the new empire of the United States. And that's that's the fact. We have to just sort of nod our heads in agreement brainlessly without thinking about, well, maybe we're missing something. Maybe, maybe no empire has ever historically willfully disintegrated itself. Mm. Um, and maybe, maybe there's something else that happened <laughs> that we haven't been told about. So, Richard, it, it, we've only got about... 12 minutes or 13 minutes left before the end of the show but how what do you think people need to understand what how do you, how do you help people see the causal agency of the undead british empire behind you know the rothschilds soros america eric prince of black black uh, water uh, how do you how do you help people see that that's actually causal it's not like the british empire is captured by the jewish bankers and that's why the british empire is acting bad cuz Brit- jewish bankers are there or it's not like, you know, Amer- British Empire just gave over its power to the Americans and that's the empire. But it's tough. It's really difficult, isn't it, to uh, to get people to sort of focus on the right things in the right order? Yes. Well, it's it's a it's a war. It's it's a propaganda war. And those of us who are out there, I, I guess maybe just about everybody now on social media and on the X platform, we've landed in the middle of a war. And. In this war, it appears to me the greatest powers in the world, uh, the powers of the the, the whole uh, NATO, Anglo-American power structure that, that rules the world, are focusing on this strange agenda of trying to use social media to convince everybody that one, the United States of America is the most evil country in the world and the greatest force, uh, the the greatest threat to peace in the world. Words that could have come right out of George Soros's mouth circa 1987 or the, through the 90s, that, that the U.S. is the greatest threat to, to peace in the world and really needs to be destroyed. Two, 
that the U.S. is going to be destroyed anyway because we're supposedly dying a natural death uh, just like ancient Rome. This is, this is a huge propaganda theme that is being fomented on uh, the X platform of specifically uh, by P influencers who are touted as being patriotic and uh, c conservative, and I, I, I'm just I'm sorry to say this, but but it's th that that's where it's coming from. You know, it's not the left who are saying that they don't even care about these issues. Um, it's it's people who are supposed to be on the pro-American side who are saying, well, the way to be pro-American now is to resist the globalist American empire, which is decadent and in decline, and to embrace uh, national divorce and become neo-Confederates or whatever. And this, too, is a British agenda, in my opinion, that to break up the United States into little pieces has been an explicit British agenda since the time of the revolution. And you know, you know, Winston, Winston Churchill, Churchill's uh, grandson was touring in 2012 to the Tea Party, giving these types of speeches in America, being seen as this great pro-American aristocrat, you know, hero of the great war hero uh, or some of the, a grandson of the great war hero, Winston, encouraging just this very national split amongst, you know, it's weird, but that's exactly what I, I see direct evidence that what you've just said is true. Yes. And, and so... Um... On the one hand, the vilification of the U.S., the brainwashing of people to believe the U.S. is finished, there's no hope because it's dying a natural death, uh, just like the, the Roman Empire did, supposedly. And then thirdly, um, w which is now emerging, is that the Jews are behind uh, everything, and presumably uh, the, that the Jews are the ones who are actually running this evil United States of America. This is a new narrative that's now emerging. And uh, again, by a lot of big accounts that are obviously being boosted um, on X, they're not being suppressed, they're being boosted. So these are official narratives that are essential um, to the security state, in my opinion. And the, I think, so when you ask me, what can we do? Well, from my stance as a now independent journalist, um, I hardly even know if I should call myself a journalist now in this today's environment. It's it, people seem to understand that word in a negative way. But um, as a as a journalist, as a writer, as somebody who's who's doing research to try to counter these these um security state narratives which are inimical to our country to our people to our national interests i'm just to, to me i these are the tools i have I, the ability to research to write uh to go on podcasts um i personally don't know what, what else to do i mean these are my skill sets but i'm just trying to counter these narratives and to say, look, um, are we really sure the United States of America is the greatest threat to world peace? Are we, are we really the most evil country in the world? Are the Jews really the head of the snake? Um, so these two ideas seem to be the big ones that are being actively pushed uh, in, uh, officially on social media, and they're the ones that I'm that I'm trying to counter. Um, and uh, it, it, by Basically, what I'm doing now in my articles is touching on things that are happening today, but then more trying to give them historical context. Because I think the once the history is revealed, once people understand the history, and especially the actual reasons for the American Revolution, I think these are not understood at all. And once people understand why we fought the revolution, and the War of 1812 and the American Civil War, and I call these three wars our three wars of independence, because I believe all three were fought against the same enemy and for the same reason, and the enemy being uh, Great Britain's colonial uh, monopoly, especially over textiles, and to fight for our right to build our own manufacturing industries 
here in America and to regulate our trade so that we don't have a 10 to 1 trade imbalance with, with England and its proxies as we did before the revolution. Then after fighting the revolution, it was still three to one in favor of England. And so this issue of the trade balance, once people understand that, you can see that it's still going on today. That now, I mean, I mean, this is what Trump was talking about, this, this massive trade balance that we have with countries like China, especially. And yet the British, who supposedly are not benefiting from this trade balance, for some reason, they're they're like this little guy riding on the shoulders of China saying, stop those evil Americans from from, uh, you know, in, from passing tariffs and evening out the trade balance. So and, and yeah. then we have deindustrialization. So it's they're exactly the same issues that our founding fathers fought against our right to manufacture and our right to regulate our own trade. It's once yeah. you understand those things, I think this will help people to understand what's happening today and what are, what are the issues that we face. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. I, I couldn't agree more. I'm really happy that you've, you've formulated the way you did because the battle really is over economic sovereignty and the ability to problem solve using the powers of the nation state to protect the people, meet their needs. And because the nation state is the people, the government is the people. It's not the government and then there's us in a healthy society. It's the people look at themselves in the mirror and they see, mm -hmm. oh, I am a citizen. I am an active participant in the process of governing. And that's that's like a healthy society that's that's fit to survive, meaning, you know, what it re what's required to defend as far as your infrastructure, your industry and improve upon in which the oligarchy always wants us to to sever ourselves from that type of identity and think about I'm going to decentralize. I'm going to think about my local environment only at the exp I don't mm -hmm. I'm not going to think about the whole that I'm a part of. And to the degree that we do that, we might be really good people, but we are going to fall into th Don't tell me that that's not divide and conquer. That's 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 going to be a lot easier to control a people who all think of like that than a people who are able to use the power of their nation state. And I was reminded of um six a friend of mine just sent me yesterday um some news bits there's been six conservative states, Texas being the biggest one, uh, who all signed bilateral free trade agreement agreements with uh, the UK over the last like two or three months. Really? Totally under the radar. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. I, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. It's and the media is not talking about this. This I, I went to the UK ministry site just saying what a great success this has been after years of negotiation. They've got all of these free trade agreements and a lot of red patriots are thinking what a great success we're more free trade with britain they we could trust mm. them and it's like wait a minute you obviously are patriots you obviously don't want your nation to die but you're falling into the same trap as what we saw in the 1850s and it, mm -hmm. you know with all of the the british special relationships with the confederate breakaway states all having special deals with britain selling their cotton to uh, the textile mills and thinking that they were getting a great deal and they weren't going to get their hands dirty with with factories and industries and because, you know, we got we got our peculiar way of doing things. We don't need to get corrupted by industry. It's mm -hmm. it's 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 a, it's so much. There's so much ignorance to this basic his, history and the battle to keep America underdeveloped and better subservient or or just more imperial in its in its in its proclivities so that it would be a, a useful tool of the higher empire masters. Uh, yes. across the pond it's uh no what you're doing is really important your your historical works are really good at at showcasing this current and just in this short conversation with you i i'm really glad that you came on to to help people focus a little bit um clearly much more clearly and i want to ask you about the, the the british hand behind uh color revolutions going back to the french revolution that that i was surprised that you were able to tie in the French Revolution as sort of a proto-color revolution that we've seen do so much damage in our modern age, as well as the Russian Revolution as well, as all being part of the same sort of template. So mm -hmm. I was very impressed that you did that. So I have to ask you to come back on uh, to really unpack that thesis that you weaved so, so powerfully. Would, the, would you be okay with that? Uh, I'd be delighted. Thank you. Great. No, thank you. We got about a, less than a minute left to the, the news break. Um, what where can people go to follow you, support your work? Uh, yeah. 
Well, my books are on Amazon, uh, including the, the one I mentioned, The Shadow Party, uh, that I wrote with David Horowitz, exposing George Soros and his color revolutions. Um, I have a website, richardpoe.com. I have a sub stack. I'm on X, at Real Richard Poe, all the usual places. Okay, good. So, Richard, thank you enormously uh, for taking the time today. Um, we hope that everybody seriously, seriously does the work, strengthen the mind's eye so you know the topography, the terrain that you're moving through because there are a lot of traps, a lot of misinformation. It's a minefield out there. It is a war. It is an information war, but it's more than that. So you want to be really well informed before you take action, but you got to take action too. So with mm. that, uh, this has been the second segment of TNT's Connecting the Dots. We're going to come back after a news break with Cynthia Chung and her work on Operation Gladio in Latin America, Vietnam, and how that relates to the Green Berets and what's going on today in Taiwan and Ukraine. So with that, till next, or <laughs> till after the break. This is today's news.